Thank you indeed. It is an enormous privilege for me to be with you folk. I have had occasional connections with RC over the years and with others um, of Ligonier, far too few to my loss, and it's a, a wonderful joy to be participating with them again. I would like to direct your attention this evening to 1 Peter chapter 2, especially verses 9 and 10, but I shall read 1 Peter 2, 4 to 10. 1 Peter 2, 4 to 10. Hear then what Holy Scripture says. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by human beings but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay in Zion, uh, in Zion a stone, a chosen precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now, to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer, we ask through Jesus Christ, the Lord. Amen. In addition to the individual identity each of us has, we all also have corporate identities. In fact, we have many overlapping corporate identities. For example, I belong this evening with many hundreds of others who are attending the 2009 Ligonier Conference. We form a certain group. I'm sure many here are Americans. They constitute another corporate identity. Some may be medical doctors or plumbers or pastors. Some will be identified by race, some particular ethnicity. Perhaps some belong to the fellowship of motorbike riders. Of course, these various corporate identities overlap in some sense or another. Thus, it's quite possible that there's an American here who's also a motorbike rider and a doctor, but perhaps not simultaneously a plumber, and so forth. Now, at a merely descriptive level, None of these corporate identities can claim any sort of precedence over others. Some people may actually prefer to think of themselves as bikers first and Americans second, or the reverse. Some might prefer to think of themselves as uh, medical doctors first and um, African-American or European-American second. But our corporate identity as Christians is transcendentally important. It outstrips and relativizes and reduces all other corporate identities. This is a truth hugely emphasized in both Testaments. And in the New Testament, nowhere more powerfully than here in 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. Let me reread those two verses. But you are a chosen people, 
a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. It will be helpful, I think, to follow the flow of Peter's thought in three steps. Our identity, followed by our purpose, and then our foundation. First, our identity. Peter asserts, number one, you are a chosen people. The word people is sometimes rendered race when it's translated from the ancient literature. Peter's language actually makes a specific Old Testament reference, namely to Isaiah chapter 43. Let me read Isaiah 43 verses 3 and 4 and then a little farther on in the same chapter. Isaiah 43 I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Sheba in your stead. Since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you, I will give nations in exchange for you and peoples in exchange for your life. A little farther down, verse 19. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. Yet you have not called on me, Jacob. You have not wearied yourselves for me, Israel. You have not brought me sheep for burnt offerings, nor honored me with your sacrifices. I have not burdened you with grain offerings, nor wearied you with demands for incense. You have not brought any fragrant calamus for me, or lavished on me the fat of your sacrifices. But you have burdened me with your sins, and wearied me with your offenses. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and remembers your sins no more. Now, in that context, God is addressing the people who will be rescued from exile in Babylon. They have sinned and fallen into idolatry, but God will blot out their sins. They have not offered appropriate God-commanded, covenant-stipulated worship, but they still remain His people, His chosen people, and He will blot out their transgressions. And all of this we're told in verse 21 of Isaiah 53 that they may proclaim my praise, a clause that is also picked up here in our verses in Peter as we shall see in a few moments. Now this truth that the people of Israel are God's people, God's chosen, this truth is grounded in the entire flux of the Old Testament narrative. At the very beginning, Abraham does not volunteer to start a new race. God chooses him. And in the next generation, it's not everyone who descends from Abraham. It's through Isaac, not through Ishmael, and not through the packet of progeny from Keturah. And in the generation after that, it's Jacob and not Esau. There is a choice principle built into the thing right from the very beginning. And, of course, the point is made clear at the national level when you come to Deuteronomy 7 and Deuteronomy 10, where God insists that He loves Israel, not because they are mighty or powerful or wiser or holier than others, but simply because He set His affection on them. He loves them because He loves them. Peter then applies this language directly to his Christian readers. They constitute the locus of God's people, God's chosen people. People in the Roman Empire in Peter's day 